Because that's one thing which has always struck me, that there are always threats, dangers, and problems that we face which affects all of us. And yet, so seldom do we actually all get together and say, right, let's take action together. We've got to sort this out. We all sit around, probably not in here, because you are different, you're activists, but in society at large, millions of people sit there, either in the slowly heating water or the slowly freezing water, they just think, yeah, there's no problem. And by the time they realize that there's some serious, serious problems, it's too late. And I think given that uh, we are so close to Leveller's Day, either look upon it as 363 years ago yesterday or the day actually celebrated in, in Oxford tomorrow, um, but the Levellers were a good example of how um, in a society where actually for a long time um, an, uh, an accountable monarch had been saying, I want to do this, I want to do that, up to a point where Parliament said, look, Charles, this is not good enough. Um, you've got to stop doing things your way. You've got to actually accept that power rests with Parliament. And as I was going to and fro, um, eventually, a group of people came forward and said, it's not actually about whether you, the king, would take all the decisions, or these people who have somehow got themselves sitting in the Lords or in the Commons should make the decisions, but actually, what about the people? Who have the power to actually elect and decide who should sit in the decision-making bodies, and what policies should be decided? Now, by that stage, um, the levelers make an impact, but it was too late. Cromwell was by far too strong by then, and he just crushed them. And of course, that's uh, what you be, or some of you, will be celebrating or commemorating tomorrow. Um, but it's not just all about <clears throat> big civil war or military conflicts um, at every level of society. I heard just the other day from a friend <clears throat> in South London that a housing association two years ago um, just wrote to all the residents and said the uh, service charge will be £350 um, a month now. And the residents said, this is outrageous. Uh, so they got together, put pressure on the Housing Association, actually found out how totally baseless was in the calculations. So they um, came back later on and said, uh, okay, it'll be £300 then a month. That's fair. So the Residents Association, again, they didn't sit around just waiting for something to happen. They said, can you show us how you actually arrive at these budgets? So they went through the budgets and they said, well, that's an inconsistency, that's a miscalculation, that's actually not true. Actually, if you add all these up even generously, it would come to, at best, £200. So the Housing Association said, oops, okay, maybe you've got a point. So after a bit more tension and so on, they eventually um, conceded. But that's just a tiny example of how one Housing Association, and I'm sure there are lots and lots of others, would try these on residents who, particularly those who haven't got a resident association, particularly a strong one, to actually resist, would have to concede. And for every housing association, you have lots of big businesses and corporate decision makers who would simply say, this is just how it's going to be. So why don't you know, communities come together to actually resist you can sense the dangers, you can sense the problems. Why not react, come together, and do something about it? Well, <clears throat> there are um, a, a, sort of various explanations which are given um, for these phenomena, if you like, of so-called apathy. Um, one is that people are essentially self-centered. They're selfish. Um, so therefore, people are not likely to come together to do things for the common good. Um, people just think about themselves, they think about how they can get away um, with, with, with things for their own good and so on. And this has actually been proven <clears throat> over and over again is completely false. So any actual experiments or observations or surveys have found that the majority of people are not saintly, but are reciprocal. 
in their disposition. So, you know, I do good things, reasonable things, decent things to other people because I expect other people would treat me in the same way. <clears throat> now, if I should find out that a particular individual or a group would consistently mistreat me, then I'm going to take a different attitude. But on the whole, we assume other people will treat us fairly and reasonably, and we do likewise. And, and the best research I have come across is that in American universities, where they've tried this out, this kind of testing, to so see how people interact with each other in negotiation situations, um, most people um, do adopt this kind of reciprocal stance and do very well on them. The one group of people who consistently do worse in these tests are the economic students who are drummed in by the lecturers that people are just self-interested rationalists who don't care about others. So they go into, they, they go into the tests thinking every time if I can do someone else in, I'll do it because that's the tactic, that's the strategy. And no wonder they score badly, and no, and no wonder when their policies or their thinking is translated into national policies, it ruined economies. So get rid of economists for a start. <laughs> Hope there's no economists in the, in the audience. It doesn't apply to you. Um, but, but secondly, a, a, another reason often used why people don't come together is that we haven't got a kind of regimental mechanism anymore in our society. You know, if we have some kind of um, big uh, regime or core, whatever, which would march everyone in, especially from the age of heaven knows, 10 onward, and they must all do things together, wear the same uniform, march up and down, and, and do as we tell them, as one big collective. Um, in the old days, that was the army, but we need something to re replace it now, and so on. That is completely misconceived because uh, from old fascist and oh Soviet regimes that's been tried. It doesn't actually cultivate and support community action. It destroys it. It destroys civil society. It destroys people's spirit in wanting to come together because they just live in fear. So those two are quite well discredited. But one theory of why people don't come um, together, why communities don't function um, effectively uh, as a collective unit, and is gaining quite a lot of popularity um, alarmingly so that the traditionalists in the Conservative Party are saying that Cameron uh, is not taking this seriously enough and some of the so-called modernizers uh, in the Labour Party are saying that the Labour leadership is not taking this seriously enough. I call it the kind of pure community model and this is a notion that when we have a very pure um, cohesive community um, people really come together and help each other, support each other. But when that purity is, is undermined, and this purity is often translated when you read the headlines and so on, is well, when there are too many immigrants in the country or in a community, uh, when there are too many offenders who are being treated too leniently, so they're not put away forever in prisons, when there are um, just too... Um, many people who don't conform to uh, traditional uh, morals, or whether you're talking about gay marriage or, or anything else, it's just that these things which undermine the, the, the purity of a traditional community, communities uh, start to fall apart, we have um, broken society, and so on, and you somehow need to um, put it back together and, and kick multiculturalism um, in, into touch, and that's been recurring for a while now, um, manage it to make sure that the Im immigrants' numbers will come down, stop all these sort of deviant behaviour, lock people away for, for longer, then you're going to regain this purity and then communities would, would work. Now that analysis is so false on so many levels, and in fact one of the most interesting things is that this craving for, the, for, for purity is um, of course the very antithesis of and, and, and aptly with your mosaic here, of a mosaic society. The, the, the beauty of a mosaic, as I'm sure all of you would appreciate, is that precisely you have different individuals with different elements, different colours, different features, and when they actually come together, they can demonstrate something far greater, more beautiful than each is individually. So, but beyond the metaphor of, of the mosaic community and the pure community. The truth of the matter is, 
what we need to do is to go beyond why people feel threatened and undermined by, by others who are different from themselves. Is, it, is this absolutely inherent? Do pe can people never live um, at ease in confidence with people from different backgrounds? Do people never believe and support rehabilitation of people who have broken, uh, broken the law? Um, do, do people never embrace changes in traditions and, 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 and moral outlook? Of course they do, all the time, throughout the centuries, throughout the decades. But what is um, significant is that their embrace of changes and diversity is undermined, and that undermining is correlated with significant shift of power in society. It is when people feel that power is being taken away from them, that they have become increasingly powerless, that that is a real cause of breakdown in community spirit. So looking at contemporary society, and by that I mean the last four, five decades, it is the gradual <coughs> shift from the kind of um, jobs that you have, that you have a stable job with a stable employer, and you live in a geographical community, so you know what your income is, your children would go to school, they would have a job, and so on. But increasingly, of course, the, the, the changes have been um, you can no longer um, be sure what you're going to be doing because in the name of um, <coughs> labour flexibility, um, you, you just don't know. There is no job security. Um, we don't even have to talk about the procedures of making um, people uh, lose a job or not. It's, it's, people can just simply close um, factories. They can close businesses and move it to other parts of the world. These decisions are made not by the workers or in conjunction with the workers, they are simply made by a small elite, <clears throat> the equivalent of the King Charles, the equivalent of the Rump Parliament, the equivalent of the people, the levers, try their best to say, you need to be held to account by all the people. But there is no holding to account. So increasingly, people have felt that they, they don't know, they have no power over anything, any sense of security anymore. Um, decisions will be taken by, by others, um, there are more and more faceless um, corporations making decisions and government, even when government is trying to respond to these challenges, government gets into more activities and at the same time becomes less accessible. So people don't understand even what the government is up to. So, so they, they, they all feel more and more isolated, distrustful um, and, and, and so forth. Now how, <clears throat> the question is, can we try to overcome um, this, this problem, this sense that um, communities will not uh, come together even though the problems facing us can be very serious um, e every day. Well, I would suggest that there are um, three type of things that uh, an, an, an educational body like WA, which has got an activist commitment, can, can do. Um, the, the, the three things, they're not uh, necessarily in, in this order, but I think they're the three elements that is worth you considering, is raising awareness, uh, fueling agitation, and organizing action. So awareness, agitation, and action. Call it the triple A prescription that uh, you, you, you take away. Um, the thing about raising awareness is that it's surprisingly um, prevalent the, the lack of knowledge about actually what would be the right way forward or what's a coherent way of looking at social problems. In fact, the very word um, community um, brings a lot of people to say, ah, but all that community is just, just woolly talk. Um, I think if, you know, if, if any of you try to engage in a conversation with others and say, look, the, the, the problem is that communities are not coming together, we need communities to, to, to work more effectively together, you're going to have some, quite a lot of skeptics and cynics saying, you, you're using the community word again. Um, that, that, that word has, has no meaning. It, it could mean really um, oppressive communities, it, it could mean just a, a group of people um, together. Now, actually, that's something uh, a number of theorists, um, including myself, have over the years done a lot of work on. And in 
um, my book, Communitarianism, which incidentally I, I've discovered is now available for 1p only in the very second-hand um, outlet, and uh, you only get charged a delivery charge, so uh, that's a bargain, if ever there was one. Um, but there, when, when people still go on about you know, older communitarian um, analysis, these people bang on about communities, actually there we have stated something very, very, very precise. Now, in, 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 in an outline, I said there are three features which you can use to measure whether a community is an inclusive community and therefore one should strive to promote, or is it something that which is getting away from it and therefore we need to um, rectify and reform. The first one is the extent of cooperative inquiry. And that's basically where um, does belief or knowledge claims when, when people claim that something is true, and I, I assert that um, climate change is completely natural, nothing to do with um, human activities and so on. Um, are there kind of claims um, subject to open cooperative inquiry where people can do research, people can read evidence, can um, share ideas and, 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 and therefore test um, the, the, the claim itself? Um, now, climate change is one example. Um, in fact, criminal justice decisions um, is another. Uh, what, do you have just one person saying, well, I believe this person is rightly a suspect and therefore, uh, without producing any evidence uh, and without even explaining to people that I have evidence, I can insist that this person be locked up basically forever, uh, which is kind of tricky for a kind of cooperative inquiry. To, 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 to work. So you can apply that to, to every aspect of uh, society, in every institution. Um, you can say that you know, wh where you work, do the managing director, the head, the chief executive, say that this firm, this organization, is going through this and the only way to uh, resolve the problem is that. Is that simply dictated uh, or, or can it be genuinely evaluated by open discussions and assessment? So cooperative in inquiry um, is, is, is one test of it and essentially um, the culture of university, since we are um, in Oxford, this is very pertinent, that um, universities used to, and I hope they will do uh, continue in the future, play a very important, important role in um, helping to facilitate inquiry between people whether something is true or not. They are the ones who can say, look, the government may be saying this or that corporation may be claiming X product is completely safe, but universities were meant to actually provide the kind of platform for people to say that we can actually share evidence and research and inquiry to test whether that is true or not. If universities and other institutions are increasingly um, not necessarily own, but uh, are dependent very much on corporate funding, you will be getting away from a culture of cooperative inquiry to more of a PR machine for certain claims in society. So, so that's one test of it. How uh, much are the things that you are told are true or false in society subject to cooperative inquiry? Um, the second one is mutual responsibility. Do people throughout society and in, in each different organisation feel that um, they have a mutual responsibility to others in that society? Now, you would think, and I would imagine in this room, everyone would feel that there is a really mutual responsibility to everyone else. But it's, it's strange that um, out there, something often <coughs> cultivated is that we have a responsibility only to certain people. Um.